Hey everyone, welcome to Mythology Explained. In today's video, we're going to discuss Romulus, the hero that founded Rome and became a god. Let's get into it. To set the stage for Romulus' story, we're going to wind the clocks back about 15 generations, back to the fall of Troy. Our preamble centers on Enus, the most important Roman hero aside from Romulus. Enus was the son of Aphrodite and of Anchises. Aphrodite, of course, was the goddess of love, sexuality, and beauty, and Anchises, as the son of Themiste, a Trojan princess, was Trojan nobility. Themiste was the sister of Laomedon, who was the father of Priam, who was the ruling king during the events of the Trojan War. And to bring this genealogy full circle, Enus married Creusa, who was Priam's daughter. Together, they had a son, Ascanius. Though Enus and his compatriots fought valiantly, in the end, Troy was sacked by the Greeks. Following this, Enus led his family, though his wife was lost, and many of his countrymen away from the burning city. They found some ships and set sail, embarking on a quest for greener pastures where they could establish a new city for their people. This story, which begins with the fall of Troy and ends with Enus defeating an army, taking a new wife, and founding a city in Italy called either Lavinium or Latium, is the one sentence version of the Aeneid, which was written by the poet Virgil and is basically a conflation of the Odyssey and the Iliad. We'll cover the events of the Aeneid in greater detail in another video. Fast forward about 12 generations and you get the birth of two brothers, Amulius and Numitor. Their father, Procus, a direct descendant of Enus, divided the royal inheritance into two parts. One was the kingdom itself, and the other was all the treasure in the kingdom. Numitor, the firstborn son, chose the kingdom, leaving Amulius with all the treasure. But Amulius, who was treacherous and power-hungry, used his newly acquired wealth to overthrow and banish his brother. Then, to ensure there would be no one to challenge him in the future, Amulius dealt with Numitor's children. The son was killed, and the daughter, Rhea, was dedicated to the service of Vesta, the Roman equivalent of Hestia, the virgin goddess of the hearth. It was expected that priestesses in Vesta's service remain virgins, so by binding Rhea to Vesta in this way, it ensured she would bear no children, no sons that could create trouble later on. Amulius' plan would have worked had he lived in a world without gods, but alas, this wasn't the case. One day, Rhea ventured into the woods to fetch water. Mars, the Roman equivalent of Ares, the god of war, came upon her and seduced her. They lay down together, and though Rhea did not yet know it, twin sons began to grow inside her. Months later, the pregnancy came to the attention of Amulius, who had his niece put in prison. When her children, twin brothers called Remus and Romulus, were born, they were taken from her and brought to the wilds, to the bank of the Tiber River. They were placed in a basket and set adrift down its rapids. Rather than drown, perish from exposure, or become a lucky find for some starving animal, the basket, far down the river, ended up on the bank again. A she-wolf found them, and she suckled them as if they were her own pups. Later, a herdsman came upon the twins, and he and his wife took them in. Romulus and Remus grew into fine, strong lads. Much of their time was spent hunting, but also marauding, targeting robbers, stealing what had already been stolen. They then distributed these twice stolen goods amongst their community. Remus was caught, but this was an instance of serendipity, providence even, for the lord he was brought before was Numitor, the once king grandfather he had never met. During their meeting, Remus's true parentage became known. Around the same time, miles away, the shepherd spoke with Romulus, sharing his suspicions about the boy's true parentage. And so, both Remus and Romulus gathered supporters and challenged their great uncle, the usurper. Romulus killed Amulius, Numitor reclaimed his rightful place as king, and the twins decided they would found a new city, their own city. Unfortunately, neither of them knew who was older, meaning they didn't know whose right it was to name and rule the city they were to found. To settle the matter, they submitted themselves to the judgment of the divine. Each brother set himself on a hill and waited for the gods to make their will known. Remus received the first sign when six vultures appeared near him, but not long after, 
12 vultures appeared near Romulus. Remus's sign was first, but Romulus's sign was stronger, so they each laid claim. The dispute ended in blood when Romulus killed Remus and established Rome. The city was open to all, a sanctuary for those looking to begin a new life, but as the city grew, it became clear that the population was unbalanced. There was a disproportionate amount of men, hardly any women, so Romulus dispatched people, sending envoys to adjacent towns and neighboring cities to forge alliances and broker mass marriages. This effort proved fruitless, all the envoys were turned away. Romulus then devised a cunning ruse. He had the city put on a celebration in honor of the god Neptune, and he invited folk, men, women, and children from surrounding communities to join in. Once everyone had poured in, the jaws of the trap slammed shut. The Romans swarmed in, stole all of the maidens, and carried them away. Fighting broke out, and there was a prolonged period of hostility. But before the situation could truly deteriorate to all-out war, the women who were abducted, now torn between the love for their fathers and the love for their new husbands, intervened and calmed everyone. With the divide bridged and the animosity gone, the Romans and their neighbors made peace. Romulus's rule lasted until his mysterious disappearance and subsequent deification. Storm clouds moved towards him, concentrating on him until he was completely enveloped. When the clouds cleared, there was no one there. He had vanished. It was said that he was born aloft to heaven, where he ascended to godhood. Thereafter, he was known as Quirinus. And that's it for this video. If you enjoy the content, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. As always, leave your video suggestions down below.